road leading to my cabin was long and winding, with the dense forest closing in on either side. I had chosen to live off the grid a few years back, seeking solitude and a break from the chaos of city life. My name is Kendrick Ross, and I thrive in isolation, finding peace in the whispering trees and the chirping of birds. That day started like any other. I was chopping wood for the fireplace when I heard a distant scream. It was faint, almost swallowed by the thick woods, but unmistakable. Living miles away from the nearest neighbor, screams were rare and alarming. I grabbed my shotgun, an old but reliable Remington, and headed toward the sound. As I trekked deeper into the forest, the scream came again, louder and more desperate. My heart pounded in my chest, each step feeling heavier than the last. After what felt like an eternity, I stumbled upon a clearing. The scene before me was horrific. A man lay on the ground, his body mauled beyond recognition. Blood pooled around him, soaking into the earth. His limbs were twisted at unnatural angles, and his chest was torn open, ribs exposed. I felt bile rise in my throat but swallowed it down. I needed to stay focused. Scanning the area, I saw no sign of whatever had done this. The forest was eerily silent, the usual sounds of wildlife conspicuously absent. I knelt beside the body, trying to discern any clues. The man was young, probably in his late twenties, with dark hair and a rugged build. His face was contorted in terror, eyes wide open and lifeless. There was no ID on him just a tattered backpack lying a few feet away. Opening the backpack, I found a few basic supplies, a flashlight, some food, and a notebook. Flipping through the pages, I realized it was a journal. The entries were sporadic, detailing a hiking trip he had embarked on with a friend named Blake. The last entry mentioned something about a strange noise in the woods and deciding to investigate. A rustling sound snapped me out of my thoughts. I stood up, shotgun at the ready, scanning the trees. Hello? I called out, my voice echoing through the silent forest. No response. Just the whispering of the wind through the leaves. I knew I had to find Blake, hoping he was still alive. Following what appeared to be a trail, I ventured deeper into the forest. The path was rough, overgrown with roots and bushes. Every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves set my nerves on edge. After an hour of walking, I found another clearing. This one had a makeshift campsite with a small fire pit and a couple of sleeping bags. No sign of Blake, but there were signs of a struggle. The ground was disturbed, and there were blood stains leading away from the camp. As I followed the blood trail, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and my senses were on high alert. The trail led to a cave entrance, dark and foreboding. The air around it was colder, and a foul smell emanated from within. Taking a deep breath, I entered the cave, my flashlight cutting through the darkness. The smell grew stronger, a mix of rot and decay. My footsteps echoed off the walls and I strained to hear any sound of life. About fifty feet in, I found Blake. He was alive, but barely. His body was slumped against the wall, covered in blood and wounds. Kendrick, he croaked, recognizing me through half-lidded eyes. Help! I rushed to his side, assessing his injuries. They were severe, but he was alive. What happened? I asked, tearing off a piece of my shirt to bandage his wounds. It came out of nowhere, he whispered, his voice weak. Some kind of creature. It took Ethan. Creature? What kind of creature? I pressed. But Blake passed out, his body too weak to continue. I knew I had to get him back to my cabin and call for help. As I prepared to lift him, a low noise echoed through the cave. My blood ran cold. Turning slowly, I saw it. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs, hunched over with a grotesque, animalistic body. Its skin was mottled and scarred, with patches of fur and exposed flesh. 
clawed hands and feet dug into the rocky ground, and its face was a twisted snarl of sharp teeth and a snout-like nose. Instinct took over. I fired my shotgun, the blast reverberating through the cave. The creature roared in pain but didn't go down. It lunged at me, moving faster than I anticipated. I barely had time to react, swinging the shotgun like a club. The butt of the gun connected with its head and the creature staggered back. I took the opportunity to grab Blake and haul him over my shoulder. The creature recovered quickly, its eyes burning with rage. I ran, adrenaline fueling my steps. The creature's roars echoed behind me, growing closer. I burst out of the cave, the sudden daylight blinding me for a moment. I didn't stop, pushing my body to its limits as I made my way back to the campsite. The creature was relentless, crashing through the underbrush. I could hear its snarls and the snapping of branches. Just as I reached the camp, it lunged again. This time it caught me off guard, knocking me to the ground. Blake fell from my shoulder, landing with a thud. The creature loomed over me, its foul breath hot on my face. I scrambled for my shotgun, but it was just out of reach. The creature's claws raked across my chest, and I screamed in pain. In a last-ditch effort, I grabbed a burning log from the fire pit and swung it at the creature's face. The flames caught its fur, and it shrieked, recoiling. I didn't waste any time, grabbing Blake again and running. The creature was distracted, trying to put out the flames. I made it back to my cabin, barricading the door behind me. I laid Blake on the couch and called 911, my hands shaking. There's something out here, I told the dispatcher. A creature. It killed someone and attacked us. We need help now. The minutes felt like hours as I waited for the authorities. I tended to Blake's wounds as best as I could, but he needed a hospital. When the police and paramedics finally arrived, I felt a wave of relief. They took Blake away on a stretcher, assuring me he'd be okay. The police questioned me about what happened, and I told them everything. They seemed skeptical, but promised to investigate. Days later, I received a call from the lead investigator. Mr. Ross, we found evidence of a struggle in some unusual tracks, but we haven't located the creature you described. We're continuing the search. I knew what I saw was real. The forest, once my sanctuary, now felt like a place of hidden dangers. But I wasn't about to leave. This was my home, and I wasn't going to let fear drive me away. In the weeks that followed, I fortified my cabin and kept my shotgun close. Blake recovered, though he had no memory of the attack. The police never found the creature, and the case went cold. I still live off the grid but now I keep a watchful eye on the forest. Whatever that creature was, it's still out there. And so am I, ready and waiting. I always figured that moving off the grid would give me the peace and solitude I'd craved. But, as it turns out, isolation has its own set of horrors. My name is Sawyer Creel, and I've lived in this remote cabin in the Cascades for about five years now. No neighbors for miles, just me in the wild. It's a simple life, and I prefer it that way. That is, until last week. It started innocuously enough. I was chopping wood behind the cabin, preparing for the evening. The air was crisp, with that clean smell that only mountain forests can muster. I had just finished stacking the logs when I noticed the silence. Normally there's a cacophony of birds, insects, and the distant rustling of leaves. But now, nothing. Not a sound. I shrugged it off, assuming it was just my imagination. I headed inside, planning to make a hearty stew. That's when I first noticed the footprints. Large, clawed prints, like nothing I'd ever seen before. They circled the cabin, sporadic and disorganized. My first thought was a bear, but these prints were too big, too bizarre. I grabbed my old Remington shotgun. Living out here, you have to be prepared for anything, but I never thought I'd have to use it for something like this. I circled the cabin, following the prints as far as I dared before they disappeared into the dense underbrush. As night fell, I bolted the doors and windows, something I'd never felt the need to do before. 
my radio, my only connection to the outside world, crackled with static. I fiddled with the dials, trying to catch a signal, but only managed to pull in snippets of old country music and a faint voice speaking in rapid Spanish. The night was long. Every creak and groan of the cabin set me on edge. Around midnight, I heard it, a low rumbling noise that reverberated through the woods. It was unlike any animal sound I knew, a mix of harsh snarls and high-pitched screeches. My heart pounded in my chest as I strained to listen, trying to pinpoint its origin. But the sound seemed to come from all directions, an omnipresent menace in the dark. The next morning, I found more of those prints, closer to the cabin this time. My woodpile had been scattered, and there were deep gouges in the ground, as if something massive had clawed at it. I decided to hike to my nearest neighbor, a recluse named Eli Hollis who lived about seven miles away. Maybe he'd seen or heard something. The hike was arduous, the terrain unforgiving. About halfway there I stumbled upon a gruesome sight, a deer, or what was left of it, mutilated beyond recognition. Its entrails were strewn about, and deep gashes marked its hide. I'd seen predator kills before, but nothing like this. Whatever did this wasn't hunting for food, it was killing for sport. I quickened my pace, shotgun ready. When I finally reached Eli's cabin, I knew something was wrong. The door was ajar, swinging gently in the breeze. I called out, but there was no response. I entered cautiously, the smell hitting me first, an overpowering stench of decay. Eli's body lay sprawled on the floor, mauled and torn apart. The sight was sickening his blood painting the walls and floor. I forced myself to search the cabin, looking for clues or any sign of what might have happened. There was nothing but more destruction, as if a wild animal had rampaged through. I left in a hurry, my mind racing. I had to get back to my cabin, fortify it, and figure out what the hell was happening. The trip back was a blur, adrenaline driving me forward. I locked myself in and tried the radio again, but it was useless. I was completely cut off. Night fell once more, and the noises began again, closer this time. I peered through a crack in the shutters and saw movement, something large and fast darting between the trees. The creature, whatever it was, was circling my cabin, testing my defenses. I stayed awake, the shotgun clutched tightly in my hands. Around midnight, I heard a loud thud against the side of the cabin, followed by a series of guttural sounds. My heart raced as I crept towards the noise, every instinct screaming at me to run. Through a small gap, I saw it. The creature was unlike anything I'd ever seen, massive, with matted fur and a hunched posture. Its limbs were long and twisted, ending in sharp claws that scraped against the wood. It sniffed the air, its head jerking unnaturally as it moved. I raised the shotgun, aiming carefully. My hands were shaking, but I took a deep breath and fired. The sound was deafening in the confined space, and the creature let out a horrific screech. It thrashed wildly, slamming into the cabin with terrifying force. I fired again and again, the shots echoing through the night. The creature staggered back, leaving a trail of dark, viscous blood. For a moment, I thought it was over. But then it turned those eyes on me, and I knew it wasn't done. It charged, slamming into the door with such force that the wood splintered. I fired one last shot before it burst through, the impact knocking me back. I scrambled to my feet, grabbing a hunting knife from the table. The creature lunged at me, its claws raking across my arm. The pain was excruciating, but I managed to stab it, driving the blade deep into its side. It roared, a sound that shook the very foundation of the cabin. With a final, desperate effort, I pushed it back and slammed the door shut, barricading it with whatever I could find. The creature pounded against the door, but eventually the sounds grew fainter. I slumped against the wall, my breath ragged and my body trembling. I'd survived, but just barely. As dawn broke, I cautiously ventured outside. The ground was littered with blood and tufts of fur, but the creature was gone. I didn't wait around to see if it would come back. I packed what little I could carry and began the long trek back to civilization. I reached the nearest town by nightfall, collapsing at the doorstep of a small diner. 
The locals were kind enough to help me, and soon I was in the safety of a hospital. The doctors were baffled by my wounds, unable to identify the animal that had attacked me. I reported Eli's death to the authorities, but they found no trace of the creature. The official story was that a bear had gone rogue, but I knew better. Whatever it was, it wasn't natural. I've since moved away from the mountains, but the memories still haunt me. I can't explain what I saw or how I survived, but one thing is certain. Some things are best left undiscovered. And just like that, life goes on. I found a new place, closer to people, away from the isolation that once seemed so appealing. The nightmares have faded, replaced by a cautious appreciation for the mundane. I don't expect anyone to believe my story, but I know what happened. In the quiet moments, when the world is still, I sometimes think back to that night, and I remind myself to stay grounded in reality, no matter how terrifying it might get. I had been living off the grid in the dense forests of northern Washington for the better part of five years. I preferred the solitude, far from the buzz of city life, away from prying eyes and unwelcome questions. My cabin was a simple one-story structure nestled between towering pines and a clear, cold stream that ran nearby. My closest neighbor was a good ten miles away, and that was how I liked it. You see, I wasn't always a recluse. Life had handed me a few rough breaks, and I'd made my share of mistakes. I lost my wife to a drunk driver ten years ago, and after that, things just spiraled out of control. I needed a fresh start, and this cabin in the woods seemed like the perfect place to find some peace. My name is Joel Harker, by the way. It was a crisp autumn day when things went sideways. I was chopping wood for the coming winter, the repetitive swing of the axe almost meditative. The forest was quiet, save for the distant call of a hawk and the rustle of leaves in the breeze. I remember the moment vividly, because it was the last moment of peace I had that day. As I wiped the sweat from my brow, I heard a scream. It was distant but unmistakable, a blood-curdling scream that froze the marrow in my bones. I dropped the axe and strained to listen, my heart thudding in my chest. The scream came again, closer this time, followed by the sound of running footsteps. Without thinking, I grabbed my hunting rifle from the cabin and set off toward the noise. It wasn't uncommon for hikers to get lost or injured in these parts, but this sounded far more sinister. As I ran, the forest seemed to close in around me, the trees becoming an oppressive wall on either side of the narrow trail. I burst into a small clearing and skidded to a halt. There, in the center of the clearing, was a young woman. She was barefoot, her clothes torn and dirty, with scratches and bruises all over her arms and legs. Her eyes were wide with terror, darting frantically around as if expecting something to leap out of the shadows. Hey, are you okay? I called out, lowering my rifle slightly. She looked at me, but there was no relief in her eyes, only pure, unadulterated fear. They're coming, she whispered, barely audible. It's coming for us. Before I could ask her what she meant, a low, rumbling growl echoed through the clearing. The woman screamed again and ran toward me, clutching at my jacket. I turned, scanning the trees, my finger tightening on the trigger. Then I saw it. At first it was just a shadow, flitting between the trees with an unnatural speed. But as it moved closer, its form became more distinct. It was unlike anything I had ever seen. An animalistic creature, hunched and covered in matted fur, with limbs that were too long and joints that bent the wrong way. Its face was a twisted mockery of a wolf's, with elongated jaws and sharp, glistening teeth. I fired a shot, the sound deafening in the stillness of the forest. The creature barely flinched, its eyes locking onto mine. It let out a sound that was a mix between a howl and a scream, then charged. I grabbed the woman and ran, knowing that my cabin was the only safe place within miles. We crashed through the underbrush, branches whipping at our faces and legs. The woman stumbled, and I half-dragged, half-carried her, the creature's snarls growing louder behind us. 
we broke through the tree line and the cabin came into view. I shoved her inside and slammed the door, bolting it shut just as the creature slammed into it with a force that rattled the walls. Stay back, I yelled, positioning myself between the door and the woman who was now sobbing on the floor. The creature scratched and clawed at the door, its howls echoing through the cabin. I fired another shot through the wood, hoping to hit something vital. There was a yelp, and then silence. For a moment, I dared to hope it was over. Then the window shattered. The creature's arm reached through, claws scraping against the wooden floor. I fired again and the arm withdrew, but I knew it was only a matter of time before it found another way in. There's a cellar, I said, grabbing the woman's hand and pulling her toward the trap door in the kitchen. We can hide there. We climbed down into the dark, musty cellar and pulled the door shut above us. The only light came from a small, grimy window near the ceiling. We huddled together, listening to the sounds of the creature rampaging above us. I reloaded my rifle, my hands shaking with adrenaline. What's your name? I asked, trying to keep her calm. Maria, she whispered. Maria Sanchez. Okay, Maria. We're going to get through this, but I need you to stay quiet and keep calm. Can you do that? She nodded, tears streaking her dirty cheeks. I listened intently, my eyes fixed on the trapdoor. The creature was still upstairs, knocking things over and snarling in frustration. I had to think of a plan, and fast. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the noise stopped. Silence pressed down on us, heavy and suffocating. I strained to hear any sign of movement, but there was nothing. Minutes passed, feeling like hours. Finally, I decided to risk it. I climbed the ladder slowly, pushing the trapdoor open just enough to peek out. The cabin was a wreck, but there was no sign of the creature. I opened the door fully and helped Maria climb out. We need to get out of here, I said. There's a ranger station about 15 miles north. If we can make it there, we can get help. Maria nodded, and we gathered what supplies we could carry. I grabbed my backpack, filled with essentials, and we set off into the forest once more. The sun was setting, casting long shadows through the trees. We moved quickly but cautiously, every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves setting my nerves on edge. We had been walking for about an hour when I heard it again, the growl, closer this time. I spun around, rifle at the ready, but saw nothing. Maria clutched my arm, her eyes wide with fear. We need to keep moving, I said, trying to stay calm. It's trying to scare us, but we can't let it. We continued on, the forest growing darker around us. The growls followed us, sometimes distant, sometimes unnervingly close. I knew it was toying with us, waiting for the right moment to strike. As we reached a narrow ravine, the creature attacked. It came out of nowhere, a blur of fur and teeth. I fired, but it was too fast, knocking the rifle from my hands. It lunged at me, its claws raking across my chest. I yelled in pain, grabbing a fallen branch and swinging it with all my might. The creature yelped and backed off, but it wasn't finished. Maria screamed as it turned its attention to her. I scrambled for my rifle, firing another shot. The bullet hit its shoulder and it howled in pain. I used the distraction to grab Maria and pull her up the ravine's edge. We ran, the creature hot on our heels. We burst into another clearing and I saw salvation an old abandoned cabin half hidden by overgrown bushes. We sprinted toward it, throwing ourselves through the door and barricading it with anything we could find. The creature slammed into the door moments later, but this time, the old wood held. We need to make a stand, I said, reloading my rifle. If it gets in here, we fight. Maria nodded, grabbing a rusty old axe that was leaning against the wall. We waited hearts pounding as the creature continued its assault. The door creaked and groaned but held firm. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the noise stopped. We waited, tense and silent, but the creature didn't return. The first light of dawn began to filter through the cracks in the walls. We had survived the night. Exhausted and battered, we decided to wait until full daylight before making our way to the ranger station. 
When the sun was high enough, we cautiously emerged from the cabin. The forest was eerily quiet. We didn't encounter any more signs of the creature as we made our way north. Hours later, we stumbled into the ranger station, exhausted and injured, but alive. The rangers listened to our story with skeptical eyes but called for medical help nonetheless. In the aftermath, the forest was combed by search teams, but they found no trace of the creature. Maria and I went our separate ways, each trying to put the nightmare behind us. I returned to my cabin, fortified it, and resumed my solitary life. But I never forgot the terror of that day. Now, as I sit by my fireplace, the scars on my chest a permanent reminder, I can't help but wonder about the dark secrets that still lurk in those woods. I was crouched behind a rotting wooden fence, my heart pounding like a jackhammer against my ribs. The woods of rural Montana were eerily silent, save for the occasional rustle of leaves in the wind. My name's Bram McTavish, and I've lived off the grid for nearly a decade now. I moved out here to escape the noise, the chaos, and the mess of modern life. Today, though, I was questioning that decision. The day had started innocently enough. I'd spent the morning mending the roof of my cabin, hammering nails and sweating under the sun. Around noon, I decided to take a break and check on my closest neighbor, old man Ezra. He lived about a mile down the dirt path, and we looked out for each other. Ezra was pushing 70 but tough as nails, a Vietnam vet who preferred the solitude of the woods to the bustle of city life. When I arrived at his place, I noticed something was off. His truck was parked haphazardly in the driveway driver's side door wide open. Ezra was meticulous about his things, always keeping them in perfect order. I called out his name, but only silence answered back. My stomach twisted into knots as I approached the house. The door was ajar, creaking on its hinges. Inside, the living room was a wreck. Furniture overturned, shattered glass scattered across the floor, and streaks of something dark trailing towards the back door. My blood ran cold as I followed the trail to the kitchen, where I found the source. Ezra was sprawled on the linoleum, a gaping wound in his abdomen. His lifeless eyes stared up at the ceiling. I forced myself to kneel beside him, checking for any signs of life, but he was gone. Panic surged through me as I scanned the room for any clue about what had happened. That's when I heard the noise outside, a low, menacing snarl. I darted to the window and peered out. Something moved in the shadows of the tree line. It was big, hulking, and not quite human. It looked like a grotesque blend of a bear and a wolf, with massive clawed hands and a hunched back covered in matted fur. It was sniffing the air, as if searching for a scent. My mind raced. What the hell was that thing? I knew every animal in these woods, but I had never seen anything like this. Grabbing Ezra's old hunting rifle from the wall, I loaded it with shaky hands and slipped out the back door. I moved as quietly as I could, sticking to the shadows, but every snapped twig and rustling leaf sounded like a gunshot in the silence. I needed to get back to my cabin and call for help. My old CB radio was my only link to the outside world, and it was at least a mile hike through dense forest to get there. As I crept along the path, I heard the creature again its heavy footsteps crunching leaves and snapping branches. It was getting closer. I quickened my pace, heart hammering in my chest. Suddenly, a scream tore through the air, freezing me in my tracks. It was a woman's scream, raw and filled with terror. I had no idea there was anyone else out here. Ignoring every instinct to run, I turned towards the sound. The screams grew louder, guiding me through the trees until I stumbled upon a small clearing. There, I saw her. A young woman, bound and gagged, was struggling against her restraints. She was tied to a tree, her eyes wide with fear. I rushed to her side, cutting her free with my hunting knife. Thank you, she gasped, her voice hoarse. It's still out there. We need to move, I said, helping her to her feet. Can you walk? She nodded 
and we took off, moving as fast as we could through the dense underbrush. I kept glancing back, expecting to see the creature barreling towards us, but all was eerily quiet. Too quiet. We made it back to my cabin just as the sun was starting to set. I barred the door and hurried to the CB radio, frantically turning the dials. Static crackled through the speaker before a voice finally answered. This is Ranger Station Bravo. Who's calling? This is Bram McTavish. I'm at my cabin about ten miles west of your location. We need help. There's something out here, some kind of animal. It killed my neighbor and it's after us. There was a pause, then. Stay where you are, Bram. We're sending a team right away. Can you describe the creature? I gave them the best description I could. The ranger assured me help was on the way, but it would take at least an hour to reach us. We didn't have an hour. The woman, her name was Claire, sat by the window keeping an eye on the tree line. She told me she'd been camping with friends when the creature attacked. They had no chance. It dragged her into the woods and tied her up like some kind of sick offering. We waited in tense silence, every creak of the cabin making us jump. The light outside was fading fast, and with it, our chances of survival. Suddenly, Claire stiffened, pointing towards the forest. There! I saw it! I peered out, and sure enough, the creature was lurking at the edge of the trees, watching us. It moved with an unnatural grace its eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. I raised the rifle, aiming carefully. The creature let out a roar, charging towards the cabin with terrifying speed. I fired, the recoil slamming into my shoulder. The bullet hit its mark, but it barely slowed the beast. It smashed through the door, claws slashing wildly. Claire screamed as I fired again, this time hitting it in the shoulder. It howled in pain but kept coming. I grabbed a kitchen knife, slashing at its hide. The creature swiped at me, sending me crashing into the wall. Claire lunged at it with a broken chair leg, jabbing it into the beast's side. It howled and lashed out, knocking her to the ground. I scrambled to my feet, grabbing the rifle and shoving the barrel under its chin. I pulled the trigger and the creature's head snapped back, blood spraying across the room. It collapsed twitching and convulsing before finally lying still. I stared at the corpse, panting, trying to comprehend what had just happened. Claire got to her feet, shaking but alive. We sat in stunned silence, the cabin now eerily quiet. The rangers arrived not long after, their faces pale as they took in the scene. They couldn't believe what they were seeing, but the evidence was undeniable. In the aftermath, Claire and I gave our statements describing the creature in detail. The rangers took the body away, promising to investigate further. They were skeptical, but had no choice but to believe us. The proof was right there, after all. As for me, I stayed off the grid, but the events of that day changed everything. I fortified my cabin, making sure I was prepared for anything. Claire decided to move closer to civilization, the horror of her ordeal too much to bear. We never found out what the creature was or where it came from. Some things are better left unknown. But I knew one thing for sure. Out here, in the wild, there are things that defy explanation. Things that lurk just beyond the edge of our understanding. The rangers eventually closed the case, citing a freak animal attack as the official cause. But those who knew the truth, the few of us who survived, knew there was more to it. We just hoped we'd never have to face it again. If you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have said that living off the grid in the deep woods of Montana was the best decision I ever made. It's not for everyone, but it suited me just fine until last week. My name's Malcolm Thurber. I've lived alone in my cabin for a decade now, but that solitude was shattered in a way I can hardly believe myself. I was up before dawn as usual, chopping wood for the stove. The morning was clear and crisp, the kind that makes you feel alive. 
Around mid-morning, I decided to take a break and hike up to a nearby ridge where the view is spectacular. It was a good two-hour hike, but it was worth it for the sight alone. I grabbed my backpack, a canteen, and my old 308 rifle. More out of habit than anything. You never know when you might need to scare off a bear or something. The first sign that something was wrong was the silence. Usually the forest is teeming with sounds. Birds, the rustle of small animals, the wind in the trees. That day, it was unnaturally quiet. I brushed it off, thinking maybe there was a predator around. The wildlife goes silent when something big is moving through. By the time I reached the ridge, I was starting to feel uneasy. That's when I noticed the tracks. They were like nothing I'd ever seen before. Deep, clawed imprints that led from the forest edge toward a rock formation. I knelt down to examine them, my heart pounding in my chest. They were too big for a bear, and the shape was all wrong. I followed the tracks for a while, keeping my rifle ready. They led to a small clearing surrounded by dense undergrowth. That's where I found the first body. It was a deer, or what was left of one. The poor creature had been ripped apart, its insides strewn across the clearing. I've hunted and seen my share of carcasses, but this was different. This was pure savagery. As I stood there trying to make sense of what I was seeing, I heard a sound behind me, a low animalistic sound. Turning slowly, I raised my rifle. That's when I saw it. It was crouched on a rock, staring at me with eyes that seemed almost human, but its form was anything but. It had a lean, muscular body covered in what looked like dark, matted fur, and its face. Its face was a grotesque blend of human and beast. I fired. The shot echoed through the trees, and the creature snarled, leaping from the rock. It moved faster than anything I'd ever seen, dodging the shot and vanishing into the underbrush. I stood there, my heart racing, the smell of gunpowder in the air. I knew I wasn't alone anymore. I headed back to the cabin as fast as I could, constantly looking over my shoulder. The silence had returned, but now it felt like the calm before the storm. When I got back, I locked the doors and windows, something I hadn't done in years. I sat in the middle of the room with my rifle waiting. The sun was setting when I heard the noise again, a scraping sound like something was dragging across the outer walls of the cabin. I aimed the rifle at the door, my hands trembling. The scraping turned into a thud, then another, and another, as if it was testing the strength of the wood. I wasn't sure how long I sat there, staring at the door, but eventually the noises stopped. The silence that followed was worse than the sounds themselves. I knew it was still out there, waiting. I stayed awake all night, my rifle never leaving my grip. Morning came, and with it, a false sense of security. I needed to get out, find help. But my truck was miles away, parked at the edge of the forest where the dirt road began. I decided to make a run for it. I packed a few essentials, a flashlight, extra ammunition, my canteen, and set off, keeping to the main trail. I was about halfway to the truck when I heard it again, the same snarl. This time it was closer, much closer. I spun around. And there it was, standing in the middle of the trail. Its eyes locked onto mine, and I felt a chill run through me. It was then that I realized this creature wasn't just an animal. It was something else, something far more dangerous. I raised my rifle, but before I could fire, it charged. The sheer speed and ferocity of its attack took me by surprise. It was on me in an instant, knocking me to the ground. I fought back with everything I had, but it was like wrestling a demon. Its claws raked across my chest and I screamed in pain, kicking and punching with all my might. Somehow, I managed to get a shot off. The bullet hit it in the shoulder and it howled, a sound that echoed through the trees. It reared back, giving me just enough time to scramble to my feet. I ran, not daring to look back. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush behind me, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. I burst out of the forest and onto the dirt road, my truck in sight. I fumbled with the keys, blood dripping from my wounds. I could hear the creature behind me, 
its snarls growing louder. I threw myself into the truck, slamming the door shut just as it reached me. It pounded on the windows, its claws leaving deep gouges in the glass. I started the engine and floored it, the tires spinning on the dirt before finding traction. The creature chased after me for a few yards before disappearing into the trees. I didn't stop driving until I reached the nearest town, a small place called Redstone. I stumbled into the sheriff's office, bleeding and half-crazed. They didn't believe me at first, of course. Who would? But the wounds on my chest and the fear in my eyes were enough to convince them to send a patrol out to my cabin. They found the clearing, the deer carcass, and the tracks. But the creature was gone. No one has seen it since, but I know it's still out there. I've moved back into town for now, staying with an old friend, Clyde Remington. We've known each other since high school, and he's the only one who believes me completely. He jokes about it, calls it my Bigfoot encounter, but there's a seriousness in his eyes that tells me he's just as scared as I am. I still wake up in a cold sweat some nights, hearing that scraping sound, feeling those claws on my chest. But I'm not going back into those woods. Whatever that thing was, it's its territory now. Maybe one day someone will find it, prove that I'm not crazy. But until then, I'll stay here, in the safety of civilization, far away from the horrors of the forest. Clyde and I have been talking about selling the cabin. It's a damn shame, really. I love that place, but it's not worth my life. We're meeting with a realtor next week, and I'm hoping we can get a good price. I'll find another place, somewhere a bit closer to town, maybe not so isolated. For now, I'll just try to get some sleep and put this nightmare behind me. It's not easy, but I'm alive. That's more than I can say for that deer. And who knows, maybe someday I'll be able to laugh about this, tell it as a crazy campfire story. But not today. Today, I'm just trying to forget. I don't know what that thing was, and I'm not sure I want to. But one thing's for sure. I'll never look at the woods the same way again. It's a beautiful, wild place, but it's got its secrets, and some of those secrets are better left undiscovered. The realtor came by yesterday. We signed the papers, and the cabin is officially on the market. Clyde offered to help me find a new place, and I think I'll take him up on it. Something with a bit more light, maybe a nice garden. Somewhere I can feel safe again. Life goes on, as they say. And so will I. You know, living off the grid has its perks. No nosy neighbors, no city noise, and definitely no one asking you what you do for a living. I moved to a remote cabin in the Pacific Northwest about ten years ago mainly to escape the rat race and get some peace and quiet. My name's Enoch Winslow, and I've always preferred my own company to the buzz of city life. I've been through my fair share of hardships, but nothing quite prepared me for what happened one day while I was out checking my traps. The day started out normal enough. I was up before dawn, brewing coffee on the wood stove, and planning my route for the day. The forest around my cabin is dense, filled with towering pines and underbrush that could swallow a person whole. It's beautiful, but also unforgiving. The locals in town, about an hour's drive away, always told stories about strange sightings and unexplained disappearances in these woods, but I never put much stock in them. By mid-morning I was a few miles out following a narrow game trail. The air was cool and the forest was alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves. I checked a few traps, mostly empty, a couple with rabbits, and was making my way to the last one when I noticed something odd. The forest had gone eerily silent, like someone had hit a mute button. No birds, no wind, just my own breathing and the crunch of leaves underfoot. As I approached the final trap, I saw it was torn apart, not just damaged, completely shredded, like it had been hit by a tornado. I was crouching down to inspect it when I heard a low rustling behind me. I turned, half expecting to see a bear or a cougar, but it was worse, much worse. Standing about twenty yards away was a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. 
It was tall, maybe seven or eight feet, with matted fur that clung to its gaunt frame. Its limbs were long and unnaturally thin, ending in clawed hands that looked more like talons. Its face was a twisted snarl, full of sharp teeth that glinted even in the dim forest light. My first instinct was to run, but my legs felt like they were glued to the ground. The creature took a step toward me, its eyes fixed on mine, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I knew I had to do something, so I grabbed the knife from my belt and held it out in front of me, not that it would do much good against something like this. Before I could react, the creature lunged at me with incredible speed. I managed to dodge to the side, but its claws raked across my arm, leaving deep gashes. I stumbled and fell, the pain searing through me. The creature snarled and circled around, ready to strike again. I scrambled to my feet, trying to think of a plan. Just then a shot rang out. The creature stopped in its tracks, a look of surprise on its face. I turned to see a man standing a few yards away holding a rifle. He was older, with a weathered face and eyes that spoke of many hard years. Get behind me, he shouted, and I didn't need to be told twice. The creature let out a roar and charged at the man. He fired again, hitting it square in the chest, but it barely flinched. With a final desperate lunge, the creature swiped at the man, sending him sprawling to the ground. But it was wounded now, moving slower. I saw my chance and grabbed a fallen branch, swinging it with all my might at the creature's head. The branch broke on impact, but it was enough to knock the creature off balance. It staggered back, giving me a moment to drag the man to his feet. Together, we backed away slowly, not taking our eyes off the creature. After what felt like an eternity, it turned and disappeared into the forest, its movements eerily silent once more. The man and I stood there, breathing heavily, trying to process what had just happened. Thanks, I managed to say, wincing at the pain in my arm. Name's Saul, he replied, still holding the rifle ready. Saw you in trouble and figured you could use a hand. We made our way back to my cabin, where Saul helped me clean and bandage my wounds. As we sat by the fire, he told me about the creature. He'd seen it before, years ago, and had been tracking it ever since. It was responsible for several disappearances in the area, and he was determined to put an end to its reign of terror. I've been living out here for a long time, Saul said, staring into the flames. Never seen anything like that, though. It's not natural. I nodded, still trying to wrap my head around the day's events. So... What do we do now? Saul looked at me, a determined glint in his eye. We find it, and we kill it. For good. We spent the next few hours planning our next move. Saul had a small arsenal of weapons back at his place, and we decided to head there first light. As the fire crackled and the night grew darker, I felt a strange sense of resolve. This creature had invaded my home, my sanctuary, and I wasn't going to let it get away with that. Morning came quickly, and we set out as soon as the first light hit the trees. Saul's place was a few miles away, deeper into the forest. The walk was tense, both of us on high alert for any sign of the creature. The forest was still quiet, but now it felt oppressive, like it was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. When we arrived at Saul's cabin, he quickly armed us with rifles, extra ammo, and a couple of heavy-duty hunting knives. We're going to track it, he said, his voice steady. And this time, we finish it. We moved cautiously through the forest, following the trail of destruction the creature had left in its wake. It was slow going, but after a few hours we found fresh tracks. They led us to a cave hidden in a rocky outcrop, its entrance partially obscured by overgrown bushes. This is it, Saul whispered his grip tightening on his rifle. Stay close and be ready. We crept into the cave, the darkness swallowing us up. The air was damp and cold, and the smell of decay was overpowering. I could hear the faint drip of water echoing through the tunnel. As we ventured deeper, the passage widened, revealing a large chamber. In the dim light, I could make out bones scattered across the floor, animal and human. Suddenly the creature emerged from the shadows, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. 
It let out a guttural roar and charged at us. Saul fired his rifle, the shot echoing like thunder in the confined space. The bullet hit the creature, but it kept coming, its claws slashing through the air. I aimed my rifle and fired, hitting it in the leg. It stumbled, giving Saul enough time to reload and fire again. This time, the shot hit its head, and the creature let out a final, ear-piercing shriek before collapsing to the ground. We stood there, panting and covered in sweat, as the reality of what we'd done sank in. The creature was dead, its reign of terror finally over. Saul and I made our way out of the cave, the morning light blinding after the darkness. We didn't say much as we walked back to his cabin, both lost in our thoughts. Back at the cabin, we cleaned up and patched our wounds. Saul offered me a drink and we sat on his porch, watching the sun set over the trees. Well, Enoch, we did it, Saul said, raising his glass. Here's to surviving another day. I raised mine in return, a faint smile on my lips. Here's to that. The forest was peaceful again, the birds singing as if nothing had happened, but I knew better. The scars on my arm were a constant reminder of the creature we'd faced and the friends I'd lost to it. Still, I felt a sense of closure, knowing that Saul and I had put an end to its terror. As night fell, I headed back to my cabin, ready to return to the quiet life I'd fought so hard to protect. And that's how Enoch Winslow, a man who once sought solitude in the wild, became part of a legend, a tale of survival and courage in the face of an unimaginable horror. I can tell you this, living off the grid was supposed to be peaceful. That's what I thought when I moved to this little cabin in the Montana wilderness. No neighbors for miles, just me, the trees, and the quiet. It wasn't my first choice, but after a rough divorce and losing my job, I needed to get away from everything. I was determined to start over, to find some peace in the solitude. But I never expected the nightmare that unfolded. It started like any other day. I woke up early, brewed some coffee, and stepped outside to watch the sunrise. The air was crisp, and the forest was alive with the sounds of birds and rustling leaves. I had some chores to do. Chop wood, check the perimeter, make sure everything was in order. It was a routine that brought a sense of normalcy to my otherwise chaotic life. By midday, the sun was high, and I decided to take a break. I grabbed a sandwich and headed to my favorite spot by the creek. It was a serene place with clear water flowing over smooth stones and tall pines providing shade. I sat on a fallen log, lost in thought, when I noticed something strange. There were deep gouges in the bark of a nearby tree, like claw marks. Big ones. I felt a chill, but I brushed it off. Probably just a bear, I told myself. They're common around here, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. I decided to head back to the cabin, and that's when I heard it. A low, rumbling sound. It wasn't a growl or anything like that. It was more like a deep, resonant hum coming from deep within the forest. Curiosity got the better of me, so I grabbed my old hunting rifle from the cabin and set out in the direction of the sound. The forest seemed darker, more foreboding, as I moved deeper into the trees. The hum grew louder, more insistent. My heart was pounding, but I pressed on. I stumbled upon an old abandoned mine entrance. It was partially caved in, with wooden beams supporting the crumbling earth. The hum was definitely coming from inside. I should have turned back. Any sane person would have. But I was drawn to it, like a moth to a flame. I squeezed through the narrow opening and found myself in a dimly lit tunnel. The walls were lined with strange symbols carved into the rock. They looked ancient, like something out of a forgotten civilization. The hum was louder now, almost deafening. It seemed to vibrate through my bones. 
I followed the tunnel deeper until I reached a cavernous chamber. The ceiling was high and the air was thick with an earthy metallic smell. In the center of the room was a large circular pit. The hum was coming from within it, a pulsating energy that seemed to draw me closer. I peered over the edge and saw something that made my blood run cold. At the bottom of the pit was a mass of writhing black tendrils. They moved with a sinister grace, like living shadows. And then I saw them. Human remains. Bones and decayed flesh tangled in the tendrils. I stumbled back, horrified. Before I could react, one of the tendrils shot up, wrapping around my leg. It was cold, clammy, and impossibly strong. I screamed and tried to pull away, but it was no use. It yanked me off my feet, dragging me toward the pit. I fired my rifle, but the bullet seemed to have no effect. Panic set in as I was pulled closer to the edge. I grabbed at the rocks, trying to find something to hold on to. Just when I thought it was the end, the tendril suddenly released me. I scrambled back, gasping for breath. The hum had stopped, and the tendrils retreated back into the pit. I didn't wait to find out what had happened. I bolted out of the tunnel, through the forest, and back to my cabin. I locked the door, grabbed a flashlight and more ammunition, and tried to calm down. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of what I'd seen. It couldn't be real. It had to be some kind of hallucination. As night fell, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. The forest was eerily quiet, devoid of the usual sounds of nocturnal creatures. I stayed up, rifle in hand, staring out the window. Hours passed and nothing happened. I started to think maybe it was all in my head. Then I heard it again, the hum. This time, it was right outside my cabin. I grabbed the flashlight and cautiously opened the door. The light cut through the darkness, revealing nothing at first. But then I saw them, two glowing eyes staring at me from the edge of the forest. They were huge, set in a massive, shadowy figure. It stepped into the light, and I saw it clearly for the first time. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. It stood on two legs towering over me with a hunched back and long, sinewy arms that ended in clawed hands. Its skin was a dark, mottled gray, and it seemed to absorb the light around it. I froze, paralyzed by fear. The creature let out a low, rumbling sound, and I could feel the vibrations in my chest. It took a step forward, and I fired my rifle. The shot echoed through the night, but the creature barely flinched. It kept coming, its eyes locked on mine. I backed up into the cabin, slamming the door shut. The creature pounded on the walls, shaking the whole structure. I fired again, aiming for its head, but it was like shooting at a tank. The bullets had no effect. I was out of options. I ran to the back of the cabin, grabbed a can of gasoline, and doused the floor. If I couldn't kill it, maybe I could burn it. I struck a match and threw it on the gasoline. Flames erupted, spreading quickly. The creature roared in anger, smashing through the door. I ran out the back, hoping the fire would slow it down. I didn't stop until I reached the creek. I turned back and saw the cabin engulfed in flames, the creature thrashing inside. For a moment, I thought it was over. But then it burst out of the fire, still coming for me. I had nothing left. No bullets, no shelter, nowhere to run. I was exhausted, barely able to stand. The creature was on me in seconds, its claws sinking into my flesh. The pain was unbearable, and I screamed, thrashing against its grip. Just when I thought I was done for, a shot rang out. The creature recoiled, dropping me to the ground. I looked up and saw a figure standing at the edge of the clearing, rifle in hand. It was a man, older, with a weathered face and a determined look in his eyes. He fired again, and this time the creature stumbled back. I scrambled to my feet and ran to him. He handed me a spare rifle, and together we unloaded on the creature. It howled in pain, finally showing signs of weakness. We kept firing until it collapsed, twitching on the ground. We stood there, panting, watching the creature's lifeless body. The man turned to me and nodded. 
Name's Gideon. Heard the commotion and came to help. I shook his hand, grateful beyond words. I'm Theodore. Thank you. Gideon nodded again. We need to make sure it's really dead. These things have a way of coming back. We approached the creature cautiously. Gideon pulled out a knife and began cutting into its flesh, removing what looked like a small, pulsating organ. He crushed it under his boot, and the creature let out one final dying screech. We burned the body, watching until there was nothing left but ashes. As the first light of dawn broke, we finally relaxed. Gideon helped me back to his cabin where he patched up my wounds and gave me some food and water. You should stay here for a while, he said. It's not safe out there alone. I nodded, too exhausted to argue. Gideon was a loner like me, but he had a wealth of knowledge about the creatures in these woods. Over the next few days, he taught me how to defend myself, how to track and hunt, and how to survive. As I recovered, I realized that my life had changed forever. The peace and solitude I had sought in the wilderness had turned into a fight for survival. But I wasn't alone anymore. I had a friend, an ally, and together we would face whatever came next. And in that strange, twisted way, I found a new sense of purpose. Living off the grid wasn't just about escaping my past anymore. It was about surviving, about fighting back, and about finding strength in the face of unimaginable terror. The chirping of birds is my morning alarm here, nestled in the dense forests of the Pacific Northwest. This place is as far from civilization as one can get without crossing into Canada. I'm off the grid, but that doesn't mean I live in isolation. Just differently. The air is clean, the rivers crystal clear, and the nights are both tranquil and terrifyingly quiet. My name's Finn Drexler, and I've been living here for about ten years now. Today started like any other. I brewed my coffee over a campfire and went about my morning routine. I've always enjoyed the simple life, far removed from the hustle and bustle of city living. I spent the morning fixing a leak in the roof of my cabin. Nothing too exciting. Just another day off the grid. By midday, I decided to head out to check on my traps. I hunt and forage to sustain myself. As I made my way through the forest, I noticed something strange. One of my traps was not only broken, but twisted beyond recognition. It looked like something massive had destroyed it. I knelt down, examining the remnants. Thick, dark fur was caught in the metal teeth. I hadn't seen anything like it before. I followed the trail, curiosity getting the better of me. It led deeper into the woods, to a part I hadn't explored much. The forest grew denser, the canopy thicker, blocking out most of the sunlight. That's when I stumbled upon something that made my blood run cold, a carcass of a deer, mauled and torn apart. I'm used to seeing animal kills, but this was different. It was brutal, savage, as if the creature responsible had done it for pleasure rather than survival. I heard rustling behind me and turned quickly, my heart pounding. Nothing, just the wind in the trees. But I felt it, a presence, something watching me. I decided it was time to head back. Whatever was out there, I didn't want to meet it unprepared. Back at the cabin, I secured all the windows and doors. The sense of unease didn't leave me. I faced bears, wolves, and even a rogue mountain lion once. But this felt different. More sinister. Night fell, and with it came a storm. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and the wind howled through the trees. I sat by the fire, shotgun by my side, trying to shake off the feeling of being watched. I must have dozed off because the next thing I knew there was a loud crash. I jolted awake, heart racing. Something had smashed one of the windows. I grabbed the shotgun and cautiously made my way towards the noise. The rain was pouring in through the broken window, but that wasn't what caught my attention. It was the figure standing just outside, illuminated by a flash of lightning. It was massive, hunched over, 
with glowing eyes that pierced through the darkness. It let out a sound, a mix between a growl and a screech, something that made every hair on my body stand on end. I fired a shot, and it disappeared into the woods. My hands were shaking as I tried to process what I'd seen. It wasn't any animal I'd ever encountered. I spent the rest of the night in a state of high alert, every creak and groan of the cabin sending me into a panic. Morning came and I cautiously stepped outside. The rain had washed away most of the tracks, but I could still see large, deep footprints leading away from the cabin. I needed answers. I decided to hike to my neighbor's place, if you could call someone living ten miles away a neighbor. Eric Tuller was a recluse, much like me, but he knew these woods better than anyone. It took me a couple of hours to get there. His cabin was smaller than mine, surrounded by all sorts of talismans and charms. Eric was superstitious, believed in all sorts of things that I usually laughed off. But after last night, I wasn't laughing. Finn, what brings you out here? He asked, surprised to see me. I told him everything, about the traps, the deer, the creature. His expression grew serious, almost fearful. You've encountered the Wendigo, he said gravely. The what? I asked, thinking he was pulling my leg. The Wendigo. It's an old legend around these parts. A creature that's more spirit than flesh, drawn to those who live alone, those who stray too far from civilization. It's said to be insatiable, always hungry, always hunting. I didn't know what to say. It sounded like something out of a horror movie, but the fear in Eric's eyes was real. There are ways to protect yourself, he continued charms, rituals. You need to stay vigilant. I thanked him, though I wasn't entirely convinced. Still, I took some of his charms and headed back, my mind racing. Could it really be true? Was I being hunted by some supernatural creature? That night, I followed Eric's advice, placing the charms around my cabin, lighting a protective fire. I didn't sleep, kept my shotgun close, and waited. Hours passed with nothing but the sound of the wind and the crackling fire. Just as I was beginning to think it was all in my head, I heard it. The same unearthly screech, closer this time. I stepped outside, shotgun ready. The forest was eerily quiet, the usual sounds of nocturnal life absent. Then I saw it, standing at the edge of the firelight, its form shifting and flickering like a shadow brought to life. It moved with unnatural speed, circling the cabin, testing the boundaries of the fire's light. I fired again, but it didn't seem to care. It was toying with me, enjoying the hunt. Desperation set in. I knew I couldn't fight this thing with bullets. I remembered something Eric had said about how the Wendigo feared fire. I grabbed a burning log from the fire pit and hurled it at the creature. It shrieked, a sound that tore through the night, and for a moment, it recoiled. I used the opportunity to grab more logs, creating a barrier of flames. The creature paced back and forth, eyes glowing with rage, but it didn't cross the fire. The standoff lasted until dawn. As the first light of day broke through the trees, the Wendigo let out one last, bone-chilling cry and vanished into the forest. I collapsed, exhaustion taking over. Eric arrived later that morning having heard the commotion. He helped me repair the window and reinforced the cabin with more charms and talismans. Keep the fire burning at all times, he advised. It's the only thing that'll keep it at bay. I nodded, grateful for his help. We didn't speak much after that. Eric returned to his cabin and I was left alone with my thoughts. The forest, once a place of solace, now felt like a prison. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig, sent me into a state of high alert. Over the next few weeks, I fortified my defenses, building a larger fire pit and keeping a constant supply of wood. I rarely ventured far from the cabin, and when I did, I was always armed and vigilant. The Wendigo never showed itself again, but I knew it was out there, waiting, 
watching. I decided to keep living off the grid, despite the danger. This was my home, and I wasn't going to let some creature drive me away. But I was no longer the same person. The forest had changed for me, the shadows deeper, the nights darker. I was a survivor, and I would remain one. It wasn't the kind of day you forget. I just finished my morning coffee when the generator sputtered and died. Living off the grid had its perks, but reliable electricity wasn't one of them. I cursed under my breath, pulled on my boots, and headed out to see what was wrong. My name's Levi Jensen, and I live alone in a cabin deep in the woods of Oregon. After a messy divorce and losing my job, I figured getting away from everything was the best way to start over. The nearest neighbor was miles away, and I liked it that way. But sometimes, being this isolated had its downsides. The forest around my cabin was dense, with towering pines and a thick underbrush that seemed to swallow up the light. I liked the solitude, the quiet, and the way the world felt distant and manageable. But that morning, as I made my way to the generator, something felt off. The usual sounds of the forest were muted, replaced by an eerie silence that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I found the generator easily enough, half hidden by a fallen tree branch. It looked like something had chewed through the fuel line. Damn raccoons, I thought. I knelt down to inspect the damage when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes behind me. I turned, expecting to see a raccoon or maybe a deer, but there was nothing there, just the dense, dark forest stretching out in every direction. I shook off the feeling of unease and got back to work. Fixing the generator took longer than I'd hoped, and by the time I finished, the sun was already high in the sky. Heading back to the cabin, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It was probably just paranoia. Living alone in the woods does that to you. But as the day wore on, the feeling grew stronger. I tried to ignore it, focusing on my chores, but every time I glanced out a window, I swore I saw something moving just out of sight. By the time night fell, I was on edge. I double-checked the locks on the doors and windows, something I hadn't done in months. Normally, the forest felt like a safe, impenetrable barrier, but tonight, it felt like a threat. I was halfway through dinner when I heard it. A low, rumbling noise that seemed to vibrate through the floorboards. I froze, fork halfway to my mouth, and listened. The sound came again, louder this time, followed by the unmistakable sound of something heavy moving through the underbrush. I grabbed my flashlight and headed to the front door. My rifle was leaning against the wall next to it, but I didn't take it. I didn't want to believe I'd need it. I stepped outside, the beam of the flashlight cutting through the darkness. The sound was closer now, coming from the direction of the generator. Who's there? I called out, my voice sounding small and hollow in the still night air. There was no response, just the sound of something moving, something big. I edged forward, flashlight shaking in my hand. The beam caught something, a flash of movement, a shadow darting between the trees. I stepped closer, trying to get a better look, when the sound stopped. The silence that followed was absolute, pressing in on me from all sides. Then, without warning, something lunged out of the darkness. I barely had time to react, the flashlight flying from my hand as I was knocked to the ground. Pain exploded in my side, sharp and blinding, as something heavy landed on top of me. I scrambled to my feet, kicking and punching blindly. My hand brushed against the flashlight, and I grabbed it, swinging it wildly. The beam illuminated a creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. It was hunched and twisted, with limbs that seemed to bend in impossible ways. Its skin was pale and slick, glistening in the flashlight's beam. It snarled, a sound that seemed to come from deep within its chest, and lunged at me again. I swung the flashlight, connecting with its head. It let out a high-pitched scream and backed off, disappearing into the darkness as quickly as it had appeared. I didn't wait to see if it would come back. I turned and ran, 
crashing through the underbrush, not caring about the branches that tore at my clothes and skin. I could hear it behind me, the sound of its pursuit, a constant reminder that I couldn't stop. I burst into the cabin, slamming the door behind me and throwing the bolt. My heart was pounding, my breath coming in ragged gasps. I grabbed the rifle and checked the chamber, loaded. I stood there, back against the door, waiting. The silence was almost worse than the noise. Minutes passed, then an hour. I didn't move, didn't dare to breathe too loudly. Then, just as suddenly as it had started, the noise was back, louder and closer than ever. The door shook, the wood creaking under the force of whatever was on the other side. I aimed the rifle at the door, finger on the trigger. The pounding grew louder, more frantic, and then there was a sound like wood splintering. The door burst open, and the creature was there, its eyes wild and furious. I fired, the recoil of the rifle slamming into my shoulder. The creature let out another scream, this one filled with pain and rage. It staggered back, but didn't fall. I fired again and again, each shot pushing it further back until it finally collapsed, a twisted heap on the floor. I stood there, breathing heavily, staring at the thing that had nearly killed me. Its body was still, the only movement the slow, steady pooling of blood beneath it. I didn't move, didn't lower the rifle until I was sure it was dead. The sun was rising by the time I finally moved. I stepped over the creature's body and out into the yard. The forest was quiet again, the sense of unease gone. I knew I should call someone, report what had happened, but I didn't. Instead, I grabbed a shovel and started digging. I buried the creature at the edge of the clearing, deep enough that I hoped nothing would dig it up. When I was done, I stood there for a moment, staring at the freshly turned earth. Then I went back inside, cleaned up the blood, and tried to forget about the night. But I knew I wouldn't. Every time I heard a noise in the night, I'd remember. Every time the generator went out, I'd wonder if there was another one out there, waiting, watching. But for now, at least, I was safe. And that was enough.